Of course, the other way of, of asking what it means to be human is to look at all the different ways there are of being human, of respecting the sacred, of looking after uh, children, of uh, organising sexual uh, relationships. There are so many different ways. And, and anthropology is, is important, of course, because it, it, it teaches us that the, the particular ways we think are natural, like we might think, for example, it's natural for a kid to have one mother um, and, one, and maybe one father, if you're lucky. Um, really, hunter-gatherers, people who live by hunter-gathering, live the way we humans live for a very, very long period of time, would think it very, very strange for a child to have only one uh, mother, one person it would call mother, or one father, um, because child care is collective, and the child would have a pretty much indefinite number of people it can, it can look to for maternal support and care, um, both male and female. So these are, these are three different ways of addressing the question what it might mean to be human. And tucked into that question is, a, is, a, is the question which you'll co I think you've come to hear about um, um, this evening. Is it natural and inevitable that males dominate over females? Is, is some, kind of, some kind of sexism or patriarchy the universal condition for our species? Is it the case, for example, that Male dominance is as much part of our nature as the fact that we've got uh, four fingers and a thumb on each hand. Is it something that no amount of legislation could change? Is it true that not even a revolution, maybe not even Jeremy Corbyn, um, could, um, could, could, could change? And uh, one of the things we point out here in anthropology is, actu is actually, um, although so often um, evolutionary biologists talk about the chimpanzees as our closest relatives, Chimpanzees come in two kinds. There are the common chimpanzees, but there are also uh, what used to be called pygmy chimpanzees, now called bonobos. And uh, for those of you who don't know, bonobos are female-dominated. So with bonobos, the females uh, form coalitions. They do it through a kind of lesbian um, I interaction. They rub the genitals together and bond, uh, after which they don't fight each other. They, they can, they can, if, if, there's, if there's some food available, if, they, if there's a small antelope being killed, for example, or a monkey, the females will, will have solidarity which the males don't have and the females would in fact end up with most of that food. So there's absolutely no reason to assume in advance um, that male dominance is natural. As I say, um, chimpanzees are, common chimpanzees are pretty male dominated, pretty despotically male dominated, but, but, but bonobos are, have the reverse um, gender system. Um, and then, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, yes, okay, um, there should be, uh, should be plenty of room for people who have just come in. <coughs> and while it's true that in the West the dominant assumption, overwhelmingly dominant assumption, is that male dominance, some form of patriarchy, is natural because men on balance are better at violence than women, and it probably is, we probably have to admit that's true, there are some things women are not, too, not so good at, and violence is probably one of them. Women can be violent, but maybe not equipped quite in the way that men are. It's often assumed in the West, isn't it, that something like that um, means that men, men, and men on, on balance are going to be dominant over, over females um, kind of everywhere. So I want to start by pointing out that in many parts of the world that assumption is act actually reversed. So... Of course, societies are different. Hunter-gatherers come in two different kinds, really. They can be either storage hunters and gatherers. Um, in other words, they might smoke and dry their salmon, they might dry their meat, they might accumulate stores of, of food. And where you have storage, um, the, the system tends to be fairly hierarchical. Um, where you have what's called immediate return hunters and gatherers, in other words, where there isn't storage, um, which you find in Africa particularly, in the tropics, um, these are probably the most gender egalitarian societies uh, known. So across Africa, uh, the forest people of the Congo, um, the Hadza of Tanzania, the Khoisan Bushman people of Southern Africa, women have enormous amount of solidarity, autonomy, independence and um, power. In other societies, um, especially I, I would say societies which are not um, hunting and gathering, but are hunting and gardening across large parts of Amazonia, some parts of Africa, many parts of Papua New Guinea. You, you have 
male dominance, you have a male monopoly of the most important form of power there is, which is called ritual power. Men organize and monopolize the rituals. Um, and I, 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 just, just come in. Don't, uh, I mean, there should be enough room. There should be enough chairs for We've got another couple of people. Just to say, perhaps on the timing of these, uh, these talks, some of the websites don't allow you to say 6.45. So we have to say we have to say six thirty, um, but the the actual time uh, starting is starting time is uh, is six forty five. It'll be it's obviously it's great if you can, you know, make make that time. Because somebody else is just coming along. Oh, it's Alex. Okay, so okay, I'm going to say this very simply. In those hunting and gardening cultures where men monopolise ritual power, and that's quite common. So these are societies which are, which are not, they don't have plow agriculture, they're not pastoralists, they're, they've still got a lot of hunting and gathering tradition, but they do some gardening. Very often, all ritual power is monopolized by men. So very often you have a, a thing called a men's house, a massive um, building, a beautifully constructed building in the center of the village. And it's a men's house, and only men are allowed to be in this house, and all the secret paraphernalia of male rule, maybe the trumpets, maybe the bull roarers are preserved inside this men's house. In those societies, and there are lots of them around the world, and I would argue all of those societies, men have a, a, an assumption which is the reverse of the Western assumption. Their assumption is that women are naturally the dominant sex. Women, because of women's biology, because they have a menstrual cycle which enables them to connect up with each other through the moon, women would normally be the ruling sex. You'd normally have the rule of women. And men in these societies say that in order to overturn the rule of women, you need an enormous amount of artificial effort. In fact, you need a form of terrorism to keep women in their place. And the moment you, you relax on the terror, women will resume their natural rule. So these are, these are societies where the rule of women is considered to be the kind of natural order of things completely the reverse of what we assume in the West, where the rule of men is assumed, isn't it? I think, by pretty much everybody, um, to be the natural uh, uh, order of things. So what I'm going to do is uh, start this talk about um, Was There Ever a Matriarchy? by reading out for you a few stories. They're kind of fairy stories. They're not that frightening, but they're um, kind of a little bit scary in, in, in places. Um, but these are, the, these are the stories which we find wherever men exercise a monopoly of ritual power. It isn't, I'm not just cherry-picking, I'm not just picking a few stories which suit the argument. Wherever men monopolize ritual power in these hunting and gardening societies, men will have a, a myth which says that originally women monopolized all ritual power thanks to their biology. So I'm going to start off, with, I'm going to read a few myths, and I'll, just to explain what I'm doing. Um, in anthropology, the great figure who, who pioneered this, if you like, the scientific study of mythology was a French um, anthropologist called Claude Lévi-Strauss, who wrote a, a massive work called Mythologique, four volumes of myths of North and South America. Uh, and what Lévi-Strauss taught us is to um, respect these stories, not because their contents is like true, they're, they're myths, they're not science, but what he argued is that every detail in these myths is there for a reason, and these stories are crystallized intelligence, um, telling us an enormous amount if we know how to understand it and decode these stories. But the crucial point he made is that the different versions of mythology, ma m including Western fairy tales, they're all variations on a theme. So it's not as if you have just an infinite range of different stories. What you have is like uh, one underlying grammar for all the stories, and when you come across a myth, um, a magical myth, I have to, perhaps you should stress that, there's, uh, there's always an element of magic in these particular stories, you can see how they relate to each other, how they're versions of each other. And what I'm going to do here is give you an example of this. I'm going to give you a series of matriarchy myths, and you might think, why is he, you know, why is he telling us one story and then another, then another? <laughs> What I want you to do is see the pattern. I want you to discern the, the underlying pattern um, beneath what looked like initially um, separate stories. So, the origin of the Hain. 
And this is from Tierra del Fuego, the, the tribe called the Sotnam Una. In the beginning, witchcraft was known only by the women of Ona land. They practiced it in a lodge. This is like the, the women's house. They practiced it in a lodge which no man dared approach. The girls, as they neared womanhood, were instructed in the magic arts, learning how to bring sickness and death to those who displeased them. The men lived in abject fear and subjection. Certainly they had bows and arrows with which to hunt, yet they asked, what use are such weapons against witchcraft and sickness? The tyranny of women bore down more and more heavily until at last one day the men resolved to fight back. They decided to kill the women, whereupon there ensued a great massacre from which not one woman escaped in human form. The men spared their little daughters and waited until these had grown old enough to become wives and so that these women should never be able to band together and regain their old ascendancy, the men inaugurated a secret society of their own and banished forever the women's lodge in which so many wicked plots had been hatched. Okay, version two, the origin of the Kina from a different tribe, but this is also, the, this is the Yamana, but also from Tierra del Fuego. In the beginning, women had sole power. They gave orders to the men who obeyed, just as women do today. The men took care of the children, tended the fire and cleaned the skins, while the women did no work in the hut at all. That was the way it was always to be. The women invented the great Kina hut and everything which goes on inside it, and then fooled the men into thinking they were spirits. They stepped out of the great hut, painted all over with masks on their heads, the men did not recognize their wives, who, simulating the spirits, beat the earth with dried skins so that it shook. Their yells, howls, and roars so frightened the men that they hastened into their huts and hid, full of fear. But one day, the sun man, who supplied the women's spirits in the Kina hut with an abundance of game, overheard the voices of two girls while he was passing a lagoon. Being curious, he hid in the bushes and saw the girls washing off painting, which was characteristic of the spirits when they appeared. They had also been practicing their imitations of the voices of the spirits. Suddenly, the sun man confronted them, insisting that they reveal to him when, what went on in the Kina hut. Finally, they confessed, It is we women ourselves who paint ourselves and put on masks. We step out of the hut and show ourselves to, the, to you men. There are no other spirits here. It's we women ourselves who yell and howl. This is, in this way, we frighten uh, the, you men. The sun man then returned to the camp and exposed the fraudulent women. In revenge, the men stormed the Kina hut and a great battle ensued in which the women were either killed or transformed into animals. From that time on, the men have performed in the Kina hut. They do this in the same manner as the women before them. Now, I just want you to <laughs> notice that in each case, we have a big hut it's a men's house within which magic is practiced. Um, and I should perhaps add that if you trace the history of temples and churches and cathedrals, right, 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 right back, you'll find they lead you to the, the most primitive form of church, if you like, which is a men's house. But what I'm pointing out is that the men in these men's houses, they say this men's house was originally a women's house within which women <coughs> practiced witchcraft. Um, and we stole this house or this power from women and, and when we did that, when we killed the women or turned them into animals, we then continued to practice the same magic in the same building, um, but, it's, but it's now men in charge and women are now banished from the hut which used to be theirs, from the great, um, you know, from the great um, uh, men's house. So from a, slight, from a different region, Amazonia, the tribe called the Mayanaku, we have um, uh, another version, the origin of the bull roarer. Now, the bull roarer is um, an, uh, an instrument. Some of you probably know. It's a, it's a little, it's a slat of wood, uh, an oval-shaped piece of flat wood with a hole in the end. And you, you whirl it around your head. You need about 50 of you to make a huge roaring sound. It's a woo, 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 woo. It feels like a sort of blood pulse. You sort of, when you hear this sound, you, I think you feel right. I've heard this before, um, because a baby in the womb will hear this woo, 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 woo roaring sound. Um, but the bull roarers are used in many of these um, male um, cults, particularly across uh, uh, Australia, and they're absolutely secret. They have to be hidden from women. And it, when I mention the word terror or terrorism, 
it, it really is that. In Aboriginal Australia traditionally, in the parts of Australia which were very much under the rule of men, most of Australia actually, um, shocking as it seems, but it, it was true, a if a woman by accident came across a bull roarer, maybe she was out looking for you know, uh, yams or you know, food, and she found a, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a part of a, a tree in which was had, a bull roarers had been hidden. Had been, um, hidden. Um, men would then, if they found out, saw her footprints, they would send her brother um, to rape her and kill her, and, the, and all the other men, men would um, kind of join in the murder of this woman. There's an absolute terror against women having any knowledge of these secret, sacred instruments. But again, the myths say that these secret, sacred, noise-making instruments, either trumpets, rattles, bull roarers, the men say, originally, these actually belonged to women. And because they originally belonged to women, you need terrorism to prevent women from reclaiming what was originally um, theirs. Not all the stories are quite as violent as that. So here, um, the origin of the bull roarer. Um, in ancient times, the women occupied the men's houses and played the sacred flutes inside. We men took care of the children, processed manioc flour, wove hammocks, and spent our time in the dwellings while the women cleared fields, fished, and hunted. In those days, the children even nursed at our breasts. A man who dared enter the women's house during their ceremonies would be gang-raped by all the women of the village on the central plaza. One day the chief called us together and showed us how to make bull roarers to frighten the women. As soon as the women heard the terrible drone, they dropped the sacred flutes and ran into the houses to hide. We grabbed the flutes and took over the men's houses. Today, if a woman comes in here and sees our flutes, we rape her. Today, the women nurse babies, process manioc flour, and weave hammocks while we hunt fish and farm. I hope you're beginning to see a pattern in these stories. The origin of the sacred flutes, another um, uh, story from Amazonia, Munduruku. Three women were walking through the forest long ago when they heard music coming from a lagoon. They investigated and caught three fish, which turned into three sacred flutes. The women played these to produce music so powerful that they were enabled to occupy the sacred men's house, forcing the men to live in ordinary dwellings. While the women did little but play on their flutes all day long, they forced the men to make manioc flour, fetch water and firewood and care for the children. The men's ignominy was complete when the women visited the men's dwellings at night to force their sexual attentions on them, quotes, just as we do to them today, close quotes. However, the flutes needed feeding with meat. One day the men, who were the hunters, threatened to withhold what they caught unless the women surrendered the flutes. Frightened of angering the fertility spirits contained in the flutes, the women agreed, and the men seized the flutes and the power which they have held to this day. Um, I, I shouldn't read too many of these, uh, <laughs> otherwise I won't be able to say too much else. Um, let's see. Uh, um, okay, the origin of the moon. This is from West Sepik, Papua New Guinea, the tribe called the Gnal. A woman caught the moon in her net while fishing in the river. Calling it a turtle, she hid it in her house under a pile of firewood, intended to cook and eat it later. She began to prepare the necessary sago, leaving her house each day with the moon in its hiding place inside. Um, perhaps I'll just quickly ask, what phase of the moon is it? Right now. Sorry? Right now? Right. All right, maybe right now. Yes, <laughs> yes, go on, yeah, no. Well done, exactly. So I'm glad you know. And then in this story, what phase must it be in if it's hidden un, uh, in a hut? Yeah, thank you. It must be dark, moon, mustn't it? If, otherwise, it would be up in the sky. Okay. So she wants it. That, you know, that's where she. That's where she keeps it. So, um, so she 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 left her, her house each day with the moon in its hiding place inside her hut. As she left, she barred her house, and each evening as she returned, she refused to let her husband come inside instead asking him to eat his sago outside, always outside. He wondered why. One day, while the woman was out, her husband peered through a crack in the wall and saw the light of the moon under the firewood. Calling to his brothers in secret, he obtained their help in breaking into the woman's house. They stole the moon. Singing, they pushed it up on a pole until it stuck fast to the sky. At this point, the woman was at work and saw the moon's image reflected in the red leech sago washings in her vat. Desperate, she rushed back. Discovering her loss, she cursed her husband. 
The men hunted by night, killing phalangers and feeding them to the woman until her jaws ached. At last she made it up with the hunters and demanded no more meat. My grandchildren, she said, I was cross over my loss. I took all you hunted. From now on you may eat the phalangers. So I think you can see here that the moon is in the place of the bull roars and the, and the other instruments of, of power. Uh, and the woman wanted her power to be in, in her hut. The moon preferred them, sorry, the men, when they stole the moon, they preferred to have it up in the sky. It's telling you about the difference between full moon and dark moon in terms of the power of men versus the power of women. Uh, and now I, I, I'll cut out a lot, a lot of these stories. This is the last one. This is, um, and I think this one ends all debate as to what's going on. It's called The Origin of the Sacred Flutes from the Baruya of Papua New Guinea. In the days of the dream time, the women one day invented flutes. They played them and drew wonderful sounds from them. The men listened and did not know what made those sounds. One day a man hid a spy on the women and discovered what was making those melodious sounds. He saw several women, one of whom raised a piece of bamboo to her mouth and drew the sounds that the men had heard. Then the woman hid the bamboo beneath one of her skirts that she had hung in her house, which was a menstrual hut. The woman then left. The man drew near, slipped into the hut, searched around, found the flute and raised it to his lips. He too brought forth the same sounds. Then he put it back and went to tell the other men what he had seen and done. When the woman returned, she took out her flute to play it, but this time the sounds which she drew were ugly, so she threw it away, suspecting that the men must have touched it. Later the man came back, found the flute and played it. Lovely sounds came forth, just like the ones which the woman had made. Since then the flutes have been used to help boys grow. Um, and in this case, the, the ethnographer, Maurice Godelier, uh, a very um, prominent Marxist uh, fr uh, French anthropologist, uh, comments on the story, and I think he, he gets it absolutely correctly. He says, the message of the myth is clear. In the beginning, women were superior to men. But one of the men, violating the fundamental taboo against ever penetrating into the menstrual hut or touching objects soiled with menstrual blood, captured their power and brought it back to men who now use it to turn little boys into men. But this power stolen from the women is the very one that their vagina contains, the one given to them by their menstrual blood. The old women know the rough outlines of this myth and relate it to young girls when they have their first um, period. So, what do you make of those stories? Where in the stories did women's original power come from? There's actually a couple of people outside. Do you want to come in? Uh, there should be still some possible way of squeezing you in. Um, there's a chair here, for example, right at the very front. Um, uh, is there any way of squeezing two more people in with an extra chair? Thank you. Uh, uh, what should we do? Um, is there any, any more, <laughs> more room? It's fantastic there's so many of you. Um, there is a window open. I don't know if it can be opened any... any, any uh, do we want it wider open? Wider yeah, open it might get a bit stuffy, I suppose. Is that what you want? Does anyone else want the windows to be wider? Yeah, okay, yeah, right, thank you. There's a chair right at the front here, yeah. So, okay, one, one way of interpreting these myths is, the, is, is um, was made famous by an anthropologist called Joan Bamberger in a very famous essay called The Myth of Matriarchy. And what she wrote, um, and you can see there's a lot of truth in it, she said, these myths, look, they're just male ideology. What are they doing? They're ways in which men who dominate women, who maybe punish them with gang rape, who take advantage of women, who exploit them, who use their labor, and you know, it's a completely asymmetrical relationship. These stories are men's way of justifying their one-sided rule. Because what the men are saying was, look, women used to do this to us. They used to gang rape us. You know, they used to have a, a, a big house, just like our men's house, in which they actually didn't any work. They made us do all the work. We nursed the babies, we did, we got, did all the work. The women were just idling around. Um, and so the stories are just men's way of justifying what they do today to, to women. And so what Joan Bamberger argued was we just have to eradicate these stories, just get rid of them all. 
right? Use a flamethrower on them because there's no truth in them whatsoever. They're just made up stories. Um, and you can see the point. Uh, it is, n there's no question about it. These stories are used by men to justify what they do to women. It's worth maybe mentioning, yeah. sorry to interrupt, the, mm. the context mm. of the time period, which was the early 70s, yeah. when feminist anthropologists, like you're saying, were trying to ask the question, is it a universal fact? Women's oppression, is it a universal fact? And um, Bamberg was amongst those anthropologists looking at these stories um, to see was there any justification for yeah, yeah. Um, evidence for mm. uh, matriarchy? So she's so when you say eradicate them, she's uh, she's talking as an anthropologist. But what she's saying is to feminists, don't, don't take imagine mm. that you can take these stories literally mm. because they're telling the opposite of what you think. Yeah, right, yeah. And that was in a time when another very famous feminist anthropologist, Sherry B. Yeah. Ortner had published a, a paper called is, is Female to Male as Nature is to Culture? And in that essay, very famous essay, um, possibly the most famous ever essay of, of a feminist anthropologist, uh, Ortner argued that there's something about female biology which means that women can't have political power. And she said, let's face it, women <laughs> get pregnant. <laughs> women get pregnant. They're going to be primarily the carers of babies. They're going to be pulled away from collective life. Men are free. Men can just get you pregnant and then wander off and do their politics. So there's something about male biology which gives males freedom in relationship to hang childcare. On, hang on. She really does not say that she is biologically reductionist. She really tries to say, not say that. She, she says what is there that is universal yeah. is an uh, opposition of nature and culture. And men are always... A identified with culture and women with nature and culture always dominates nature. That is what she argues. She's taking from Levi Strauss the idea that nature. culture is about linking up, forming alliances, moving around, being free of other burdens and men are in a position to do that because of their biology in a way which women because of their biology are not free. She slides into the biological reduction, but she doesn't start with the <laughs> I'm not saying and the she... the way you presented it made it seem like it was totally biological She completely <laughs> follows Claude Lévi-Strauss, who argues that culture is a male invention, and there's a reason why language, culture, ritual, and all these things are male inventions, is because males are free in a way that women are not free from the burdens of childcare, which are going to inevitably take you away from culture. Are you satisfied now with that? Yeah, that that's, that's <laughs> slightly less slightly better. It's a bit more nuanced. It's, I, I, yes, I know. I, sometimes I'm not sufficiently nuanced, yeah, and I don't mind being okay. pulled up. But I mean, the, the message was that, in fact, yes, it is true that n female is the male as nature is the culture. Females I inhabit the, the natural sphere, the biological sphere, the mm -hmm. breastfeeding, pregnancy, menstruation, all that natural stuff in a way that males are free of, free from, and so therefore there's something universal about patriarchy, and she certainly said patriarchy is found in every society in the world. Okay. And when people like myself, my colleagues, you know, male and female, when we were reading these things, we thought, is it really true that there's nothing in female biology which can actually enable connection, synchrony, solidarity, and uh, to an extent that actually males and themselves are it, it, not pretty not very well equipped to do. So in that period when Sherry Ortner and Bernberger were dealing with these stories, in that period the, there was no concept of the kind which these myths are, are talking about. I don't know if you have, whether you've got from these myths what the concept is. The concept is that thanks to menstruation, thanks to women's biological connection, through the moon with each other, women can practice what they call, what these men call witchcraft. And witchcraft, you can't, you, you can't escape it from the stories, witchcraft is closely linked up with, if you like, the curse from a, a patriarchal standpoint. In other words, with menstruation. So in these stories, there's a, there's a, there you, can, you can detect a male fear, which is exactly the opposite of the position which Sherry B. Ortner has. The male fear that actually, thanks to female biology, women have a particular capacity to link up with each other, to synchronize their cycles with each other, to use the moon as their clock, and to have a kind of power which actually men can find quite, quite frightening. I'm simply saying, I think, 
that is part of, this, part of the, the message of those stories. I mean, maybe tell me if you disagree that that's in the story. That all the stories are saying that, women, that women's lodge or hut was a menstrual house. That they make it very, very clear. And the last myth I read out says that the hero who liberated men from the tyranny of women was an incredibly brave man. He was so brave that he dared enter a menstrual hut. Oh, that is, that is courageous, you know, because menstruation is the absolute most terrifying poisonous substance. And in all these cultures, by the way, a man who's not careful and touches menstrual blood or is touched by menstrual blood, his penis will wither, he'll be impotent, he'll suddenly get oh, very old. Um, I mean, it's, it's an absolute disaster to a man to come in contact with this most dangerous form of witchcraft. Yet this man managed to do it. Somehow he, he defied death. He got into that menstrual house, found the sacred flutes, um, and came out with the prize, and then bestowed that prize on, on his own sex, from, from which point on men have had these flutes making these lovely sounds. And did you see from the other stories how the flutes are linked with water, with fish? There's a realm of wetness, which is a sort of female realm, according to these stories, within which reside these flutes or bulrurus. And that's a consistent theme. And it, another consistent theme is that women have the moon on their side, and especially the dark moon, they want to keep it dark. The women want to keep the moon down here, don't want it up there really so much. Whereas women, men have the sun, and if men have the moon, they're going to make it. They're going to want it to be a full moon, not the dark moon. That's another part of the story. These different stories. Um, right. Um, one of the things which um, heavily influenced me when I was thinking all about these topics in the late seventies and, and eighties was. Um, um, I was contacted by an anthropologist in, um, in, in America called Tim uh, Buckley. Um, and he would, he'd done some field work among a group of Indians, uh, the Yurok, uh, who live in northwestern California, close to the Klamath River. And one evening in 1978, he was invited to the, to the house of a local informant for uh, a meal. And Buckley's male, in, male friend explained that he would be doing the cooking since his Europe wife was on her moon time in her menstrual period, and they were keeping the old ways as best they could. Um, a back room had been set apart in the modern house for his wife's monthly use, and the couple neither ate nor slept together for 10 days um, each moon. And the, the woman, um, the, whole, the house was separated into two, and, but she, she, she emerged um, to, just to, to talk to um, uh, Buckley, and she described how they were getting back to these old ways and what she felt about it. And she had been instructed in the menstrual laws by her maternal aunts and grandmother, who were in their times well-known conservative Yurok uh, ladies. And she began her account by saying that w when she was being brought up as a foster child in non-Indian homes, she'd been told that menstruation is polluting, uh, dirt, uh, bad, shameful, and that, that through it women are being punished. But when she returned to her, uh, to Yurok society, my aunts, she says, my aunts and my grandmother taught me different. According to, the, according to the old menstrual laws, a woman should seclude herself during the flow because, quotes, this is the time when she is at the height of her powers. Such time should not be wasted in mundane tasks and social distractions, nor in concerns with the opposite sex. Rather, all of one's energies should be applied in concentrated meditation to find out the purpose of your life. It is a time for the accumulation of spiritual, spiritual energy, the flowing blood serving to purify the woman and prepare her for spiritual accomplishment. In the old days, according to Buckley's uh, female informant, uh, menstruating women used to communally bathe and perform rituals in a sacred moontime pond up in the mountains above the old Yurok village. While many girls performed this rite only at the time of their first menstruation, conservative women went to the pond every month. All of a household's fertile women who were not pregnant menstruated at the same time, a time dictated by the moon the women practicing their bathing rituals together at this time. If a woman got out of, the, out of phase with the moon and with the other women of the household, she could get back in by sitting in the moonlight and talking to the moon, asking it to balance her. Through the ritual bathing practice and by maintaining synchrony with wider rhythms, women came to see that the earth has her own moon time, a recognition that made one both stronger and proud of one's menstrual cycle. Now, so you might ask, what were the men doing? 
So the men had to have a sort of response to what the women... The, the women were absenting themselves for ten whole days every month. Um, no sex, no cooking, you know, nothing happening. The women were up performing their rituals in this pond. Um, so just as the women collectively retreated from their husbands for ten days, so the men used ten days as the standard period for men's training in the household's um, sweat house, a kind of men's house. As if imitating the women, the men bathed, gathered firewood, avoided sexual contact, ate special foods, and let flow their own blood, the men gashing their legs for this purpose with flakes of white quartz. The flowing of the blood was thought to carry off psychic impurity, preparing one for spiritual attainment. Men who were in special training to become uh, healers secluded themselves in the sweat house and made medicine. And Buckley, the, the anthropologist, provides evidence that the medicine baskets and dentalium shells used by men to contain their power tokens were sim symbolic vaginas. So the men are kind of saying, well, we've got vaginas too, and we can bleed, we can bleed too. And that gives us the, 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 this, this power. Moreover, um, elderly Yurok men told Buckley that intensive male training was always undertaken during the dark of the moon, while other sources indicate that this was also the time when women were menstruating. Finally, there is specific evidence that, sorry, there's evidence that specific features in Yurok sweat house construction enabled um, these people to carefully observe the moon as it went through it, uh, its, its um, phases. So solar and lunar cycles were, were you could observe them through uh, uh, the way in which these um, sweat houses were constructed with a, with a hole in the roof. Uh, while the women's menstrual houses include la included large communal dome-shaped structures heated by fires, used for sweating, and capable of sheltering several women at a time. So this is telling us about a, a kind of menstrual hut, which is a communal place of power and, um, uh, um, in, in some ways matched by the men's um, sweat house. So anyway, um, Butley was interested by this and decided to do a bit of historical research. And he looked at the old um, f notes of previous anthropologists who'd, who'd made studies of the, of the Uruk. And he concluded that there'd been a consistent male bias in published interpretations of Yurok menstrual symbolism, and that his female informant's claim about once a month going to the uh, moontime pond and, and synchronizing and using the moon to balance, he, he, he said this, all this should be taken seriously. He found reason to believe that indeed, quote, the women of Aboriginal Yurok households menstruated in synchrony, utilizing the light of the moon to regularize their menstrual cycles. And if this were the case, he wrote, then it would follow that the menstrual synchrony and power of women not only influenced ritual life, um, but had profound pragmatic implications as well in dictating the temporal structuring of activities for entire houses on a monthly basis. So in translating that, he's simply saying basically the moon was the clock, which regulated pretty much everything that happened in the village. And every woman had in her own body um, that same clock uh, and could use the moon to make sure that all women were in synchrony with each other. And the reason I'm mentioning this is just, it just gives you the, it may, you, can, you may not believe this, the, the, his ethnography has been questioned, but it's, as a thought experiment, can you see that it, you need to be able to just imagine the possibility, even if it's only a theoretical possibility, that female biology can or could, under cer certain circumstances, confer ritual power. It could be thanks to your biology, thanks to having a menstrual cycle, that this kind of solidarity or synchrony uh, might be possible. Um, so I now want to move on to a, a more up-to-date reference, and this is a rather amazing um, work uh, published in 2001. Uh, it's by an anthropologist called Wynne Maggie. Uh, the title of the book is Our Women Are Free, and it, descri it describes what happens regularly to this day inside the Bashali, which is a communal menstrual house used by women among the Kalasha people of northwest Pakistan. And Wynne Maggie was so surprised at what she found that she feared her Western readers mightn't believe her, and she explains... Quote, I don't want to make the mistake of leading you to believe that women always achieve mystic solidarity simply by virtue of sharing time in the menstrual house. Yet, one of the delightful things for me at least is that for a few days, women whose paths otherwise rarely cross find things in common. The Bashali is a place of intense physical intimacy where women share knowledge about their bodies that would be unthinkable in everyday life. So I mentioned that the title of the book is Our Women Are Free. And women in, this, in the Kalasha Valley consider themselves free whether married or not. Men are not just supportive, but proud of the fact that their women are free to travel, free once married to return wherever they like to the home where they were born, and most importantly, free to resist men's demands. So in this um, community, there are no isolated menstrual huts. Instead, there is a large sacred building serving as a communal meeting house for the women who see it as the physical center 
for their solidarity and freedom. Women congregate here when menstruating or giving birth, so that at any one time there may be as many as 20 women inside, gossiping, laughing and singing together, many with their babies and toddlers. And during their stay in what they call their most holy place, women compare notes on the duration of their menstrual flows. Uh, in the Kalasha Valley, where there are no men's houses, no temples, uh, the communal menstrual house is the most sacred building there is. Um, and it's off limits to men and provides a period of refuge and reprieve extending over several days. So what ha sometimes happens is a woman might want to get away from her husband. So she claims that she's menstruating and then she goes to the Pachali. She can also want to get off with another man, you know, so if, in order to first of all get away, she'll, she'll claim to be menstruating, go to the Pashali, she'll get a huge lot of support from other women, and then she can um, plan the elopement. Um, and the anthropologist describes um, graphically how women enjoy the intimacy of sleeping in the Pashali for several nights uh, in a row, arms and legs wrapped closely together. So what happens in the Pashali is women's secret, so much so that men don't even have the words to ask what happens there. The greatest secrets are the words used to describe menstruation, intimate parts of the body, and details of female reproduction. Um, and being an anthropologist, Min Maggie couldn't help comparing the Basali, this communal menstrual house, with what in so many other societies is a communal men's house. And so she, you can see what's happening here. She's thinking, well, okay, you have these men's houses, and then where you have the men's houses, the men say this used to be a women's house. And at first sight, you might agree with, uh, with um, Joan Bamberg. You might say, oh, these ideas, this myth of a women's house. You know, that never happens. You, don't, you never get synchronized menstruation. You can never get a menstrual house within which a whole bunch of women can find solidarity together. Well, at least uh, Win Maggie has, um, has knocked that uh, assumption on the head. Here we have, uh, if you like, the counterpart of, of, a, me of a men's house, uh, actually quite accurately reflecting the, the, the allegation by, made by men in those matriarchy uh, myths. Um, and then finally, because you, because uh, what I want to stress here is that we, we evolved as hunters and gatherers. You might want a, a, a hunter-gatherer example. So one of the best books to read on this, on the on the whole subject, really, of of the kind of social structure or social system which we humans have evolved to feel comfortable in. We all used to be hunters and gatherers. Um, our species emerged about two hundred thousand years ago in in Africa, when we were immediate return hunters and gatherers. And if you want to get a feel for roughly how that kind of society um, was structured and how it felt to be in the, those societies, um, pretty much any ethnography of contemporary uh, African, particularly perhaps tropical Central African hunter-gatherers would be a good um, introduction. And the, one of the best books is a book by Colin Turnbull, a classic account called The Forest People, by Colin Turnbull. And uh, Turnbull was struck by the... Con he, he was... Um, studying the, the Mbuti um, um, uh, in the northeast part of the Central African rainforest. Um, and um, he, what, he was, what he noticed was the contrast between villagers, the, the Bantu farmers' attitudes to women and menstruation, and the hunter-gatherer um, attitude. According to the villagers, that the farming people, uh, menstrual blood signified pollution and death it was something to be feared. Among their hunter-gatherer neighbours, however, everything was completely different. And Turnbull describes the Alima ritual, a girl's first menstruation ceremony. And he describes it as, it as one of the most joyful occasions experienced by the entire community. So you have the biggest dwelling in this community, the Mbuti, is the, what's called the Alima house. It's, a, it's the largest um, grass hut they make, and it can hold maybe you know, 10 or 12 women. And inside this hut, um, the celebrations take place. And I'll just read out uh, the, uh, from the book. So when a young pygmy girl begins to flower into maturity and blood comes to her for the first time, it comes to her as a gift, received with gratitude and rejoicing. The girl enters seclusion, but not the seclusion of the village girl. She takes with her all her young friends, those who have not yet reached maturity, and some older ones. Together they are taught the arts and crafts of motherhood by an old and respected relative. For the pygmies, the Alima is one of the happiest, most joyful occasions in their lives. And so it was with happiness that we all heard that not one, but two girls in our ca camp had been blessed by, blessed by the moon. So she enters this, the, the girl enters this hut, not on her own, but with all her sisters and aunts and, and, and relatives. 
Day after day, the women sing inside the house. From time to time, one or more girls will suddenly burst out to chase a boy chosen from among the many likely to have gathered around. So what happens is when a girl comes of age, it's a great excitement among the boys, and they sort of gather in a circle around the, uh, the Alima house to, hoping to catch a glimpse. But what the girls do is they, every now and again, they burst out with these saplings and chase the boys. Um, and if the boys, uh, if the boys run, but if the girls manage to hit one of the boys with a sapling, obviously it's, it's play, it's not too violent, but it can hurt a bit. What, 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 what happens is that the boy now is under an obligation. He has to go into that Alima house and he gets jumped on by all the girls and he has quite a, an experience. And, um, and it's probably a bit of an initiation into um, sex. And you can see, can't you, it's, like it's the, pretty much the reverse of the kind of stereotypical idea of, of what happens um, in patriarchal societies when a, when, a, when, a, when a boy has his first sexual experience. Um, so for both boys and girls, the Alima ritual is a form of initiation, initiation into adult sexual life. Um, so, okay, um, I've, I've, I've given you some myths. I've uh, stressed that the stories are ideology, they're male ideology, there's no doubt about that. But I've also um, sh shown you that the, that the idea of gaining power through menstruation, through synchrony, um, seems to be backed up by s at least some ethnography. That we, we do know of menstrual houses which are large structures capable of holding multiple women, celebrating the fact of being blessed by, um, if you like, blessed by the moon. Um, now, the, th the topic this evening is, did matriarchy ever exist? Now, um, th there's a short answer to that, and the, the short answer is kind of, well, it's yes, but not as we know it. There's never been a society where women ruled over men uh, in anything like the way in which, under patriarchy, men rule over women. When men gain power, in the, in, firstly, in these farming gardening um, cultures where men have a men's house, when men have power, they hold it and keep it and monopolize it. It's not a periodic um, s celebration. It, it doesn't go with the moon. It's, it's, it's static. Men dominate women and that's it. And men, are not al men don't allow women into their um, sacred house. And, and this men's house dynamic, arguably, is the, is the dynamic which gets continued in history into all the different versions of patriarchal religion with its churches and cathedrals and temples and stuff, which are taboo to women, as, of course, you know, um, Christianity had churches, um, which, which, I mean, there the are reasons why in, in Islam, in Judaism, in Christianity, men seem to have a, a, a strong view that women's blood is polluting. In Christianity, of course, the, the argument then is that the blood that needs to be celebrated is the blood of a man, um, Jesus, and anything, you know, anything <laughs> by way of women's blood will be... Um, uh, in, insulting or, or polluting of that um, that form of sacred blood. So, the men's house is the beginning, it seems, of all these different versions of buildings within which men monopolise um, uh, ritual power. Um, I just want to end with a, a few points. Um, it is a fact, biologically. Um, that women have a menstrual cycle which is of the length which you would predict if in the evolutionary past synchronizing cycles using the moon as a clock had been adaptive. What do I mean by that? Um, of course it's, everyone knows that menstrual cycles vary enormously. You can have short cycles, long cycles, even, you know, even if one particular person can, you can find your cycle altering in length from, from, from month to month. But when the statistics are an analyzed, the Average length of the human female menstrual cycle, the, the figures usually come out as either 29.2 days, somewhere between 29.2 and 29.5 days. Um, that is the length of time it takes for the moon to pass through its phases as seen from the Earth. Um, and of course, the very term menstruation means moon change. And there's not, there's not a language in the world which doesn't use the same word for menstruation and the moon. Uh, the word for menstruation is visit the moon, see the moon, intimacy with the moon, my moon husband, I mean, all, the, the word moon and menstruation are linked, of course, etymologically. The Indo-European root me, um, me, means measure. Um, so man, uh, commensurate, measurement, mental, mind, 
all these words come from the root of measurement, and including, of course, moon. Um, and what's being measured? Uh, time. What's being, the, the menstrual cycle measures a measurement of time. Um, well, um, you'll, you meant you'll find many scientists will simply say, well, yes, of course, the, the human menstrual cycle is 29.5 days, but that's just a coincidence. It's, it's got no particular significance, um, which, of course, might be true. It could be just a coincidence. Um, chimpanzees have a menstrual cycle of 36 days on average, close relatives of ours. With a, a menstrual cycle of 36 days, you couldn't possibly use the moon as a clock in order to synchronize. And of course, chimpanzees uh, live in close canopy forests for most of the time. The, the moon can't be seen, it's not visible, it's not very important to chimpanzees what the moon's doing. Um, bonobos have a, a menstrual cycle of 40 days. Other primates have a, a menstrual cycle less than, more than 29.5 days, some quite close to 29.5 days. Gorillas, um, well, uh, orangutans are the closest, 29 days roughly. Gibbons have a 28-day cycle. Um, I'm not quite sure what gorillas, what the figure for gorillas is, but anyway, it's the, only the human female has, the, has a, a cycle which pretty precisely matches that which you'd predict if synchrony had been adaptive in the evolutionary past. And I agree that it could be just coincidence, but why not, before we dismiss it as coincidence, explore whether or not there might have been an evolutionary reason for this. Um, and, um, well, in the, if you carry on coming to these classes, you'll probably be um, uh, hearing a, a, a theory developed here at UCL as to how and why um, we, we've developed that, that length of cycle. We evolved not in the forest. The early Australopithecus signs came out from the forest moved into open savanna, moved on two legs, and in that environment we're having to cope when we were quite, quite um, uh, you know, small creatures, not very well armed, with enormously powerful predators. So saber-toothed tigers, many different species of, of big cats, these creatures had very sophisticated night vision. And they, even today in, in Tanzania, the time when you're most likely to get eaten by a lion is around dark moon because the lions prefer to get up really close to you and eat you before you knew there was any lion there. So once a month, around dark moon, our distant ancestors would have needed to congregate closely together, seeking safety in numbers. Um, and what we think is that they would have been um, beginning to, to f find ways of protecting themselves from attacks by these large cats, particularly around dark moon. And one of the ways they began to do it, uh, beginning with maybe Homo erectus, about two million years ago, was singing, making, a, making a, a, enough noise together to scare off the lions. So singing at Dark Moon, finding solidarity around Dark Moon, um, would have been part of the a rhythm. So, what, what the, so, so but, but at full moon, it would be much safer. So if you wanted to go looking for the romance, uh, don't go around Dark Moon, go around full moon. And if you want to go out uh, hunting, tracking animals over the night, Doing it at dark moon would be suicidal, but at full moon you'd be much safer because around full moon the lions aren't interested. They know they can be seen and they tend to not, not bother to go hunting. So full moon, dark moon would have been an extre extremely important rhythm. Um, with, an, uh, with menstruation occurring around dark moon ideally and, and ovulation around full moon. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, just to end now, um, what we're arguing really is that matriarchy, if it, if it did exist, and we think it kind of did, would have been a periodic thing. Once a month, women would have gained sufficient solidarity to exert with your power. But instead of uh, seizing uh, this power and then holding on to it, you would have had a periodic um, dynamic. Um, one of our colleagues in radical anthropology group, Mona Finnegan, has called it communism in motion. She did some field work. Um, in in, in um, the Congo with a with a bayaka, and she describes how the women have a ritual called um, ngoku, where women invade the invade the, the central space of the camp um, for maybe for several days. Um, an enormous amount of laughter, ribaldry, teasing the men, seizing power, but they don't they don't stay there. They they they're quite happy to having made their point to to let go. And sooner or later, within a few days probably, the men will have their ejengi, another a very different ritual within which the men are strutting, showing off their strength, their muscles, their hunting prowess, 
And so you get a, an alternation between women's power and men's power, women's power and men's power in a, in a periodic fashion. And, and Morna called this communism in motion. So what we're suggesting is that matriarchy did exist, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't a reflection of patriarchy. It was playful, it was joyful, it was women asserting power through their bodies, through their synchrony, through their laughter, um, but being very happy to renounce power um, and let men take over, because if you didn't let men take over, you wouldn't have the pleasure of overthrowing the men again once a month. So we have this pendulum logic of matriarchy instead of a, instead of a static one, which is a characteristic feature of um, patriarchal uh, rule. We call it lunarchy. And we call it lunarchy, yes, that's right. <laughs> Um, okay, and just, uh, maybe just to end, okay, um, so often we hear this um, kind of dogma about the way things are today, that, and, and it, it goes something like this, you can complain about sexism, you complain about patriarchy, you complain about poverty and hierarchy and war and, all the, and famine and stuff, but these things are there for deep biological reasons, they're part of human nature, part of the way things are, not even a revolution. Uh, could change human nature. And what we hear in radical anthropology group, but wider than that, in, 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 you know, to some extent in UCL anthropology department in general, we're, we're, we're more and more aware of the fact that th that argument could be turned on its head. There are many things which are uniquely human about our nature. So the fact that we have two-way eyes, we can see, look into each other's eyes and, and read each other's minds, the fact that we can establish rules of sexual behaviour and, with any luck, up to a point, <laughs> manage to abide by those rules. The fact that we've got language through, through which we can share our dreams, language certainly being a part of human nature. Little kids require the very complex grammars of languages like by instinct because we, every child's equipped with that equipment. Um, so the, the, the argument we, we, ha we make is that everything distinctively human about our nature is actually the product of an immense social, sexual and political revolution. Um, and um, with any luck, having won that revolution once and having learnt and understood about how it all happened, having, having won it once, we can, we can do it again. So that's, that's, that's it. <laughs>